Uh, well, I'll tell you about myself very quickly. Uh, I work in IH London in the Executive Centre. We've got uh, about 800 clients a year and uh, teachers ranging from a group of 12 up to 30 in the summer. And um, I gave this talk recently at a, at a BSIG uh, conference. Uh, and I, I really strongly recommend, if you're not in BSIG, it's the, the ITEFL SIG, to, to get involved. They're one of the best conferences uh, that I've been to. I've been to quite a few conferences around the world, but in terms of their uh, fun, professionalism, and a variety of locations, they're, they're very, very good indeed. So this, uh, this little um, uh, flight-themed talk uh, in, in terms of management uh, training comes from uh, a, few, a few experiences that, that I've had. I um, mean, the most formative of them was, was a really bad day at work about, uh, about a year ago. And uh, you know, we've all had them. Uh, I hope there'll be parallels maybe that, that you can draw for, from my one and learn, learn a bit. Um, also, uh, a newspaper article which kind of turned a few light bulbs on, uh, you know, uh, something I read in a, in, a, in a brief coffee break. And also, I mentioned BSIG, I mean, the, the, the business English teachers in ITFL are talking a lot these days about professionalism and, and what it means. We'll come on to that a bit later, but um, uh, they all want more money, of course. And, uh, of course, that makes them think, well, what do you have to do to get the money? So that, that debate's been going on, and that made me think about other professions. How, how do they deal with uh, the, the, the nitty-gritty things of management? And also, of course, a desire to get uh, fellow DOSs talking about their practice. So there'll be a couple of uh, very brief little moments of pair work before lunch. So the, uh, the, the bad day at work, this, this was not my bad day at work, but hey, there's some, somebody had a bad day at work here. Um, mine was, uh, let's see what happened. It was a Friday. Uh, no, sorry, it was a Monday. I hate Mondays. Um, we'll go back to Friday in a moment. Um, I had a nine o'clock, um, uh, an unexpected student turned up, I should say client of course, but uh, I knew nothing about them, they weren't on my list, there was no room, what were they doing here? But they showed me a letter, they were booked for a course. So gosh, quick thinking, um, have you got teachers, have you got rooms, you know, a lot of things to sort out very, very quickly and I found all my rooms have been booked by a modern languages department today. <laughs> They hadn't told me. No liaising, oh, another headache. So after a lot of head scratch, scratching and, and running around, trying to look amazingly calm as one, one does, uh, yeah, it, it all got sorted. And eventually later on in the day, um, when my medication had worn off, I, um, <laughs> I sort of sat down and thought about it. Well, well why on earth it, was, it, was it so bad? I mean, here I am, you know, years of experience and, and uh, this and that behind me. Why did, why did I let it happen? Generally in our lives, too much is happening. Friday, the, 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 the previous Friday had been an awful day. I think it was August, uh, a lot of things had been happening. The, the phone had been going, the screen was feeding me lots of uh, emails and, God, and I wasn't even on Twitter, goodness knows. So the, the general flow of information and things to process, as we all are aware, uh, has uh, moved relentlessly on through the years. I mean, my, my first job in IH was in uh, an outfit called uh, Kilio Pisto Languista in Helsinki, 1977. I remember it well. Got disaffiliated six months after I was there. That's another story. <laughs> um, uh, we, um, what did we have to do then as, as newbie teachers? We had to uh, know one book, I think, which was Kernel Lessons, and then we had to know three buttons to push on the language lab, and, and, and that was pretty much it. I mean, photocopying, no, we, we, I, was the photocopier invented then? I'm, possibly yes, but I think somebody, you, you, you submitted your request and somebody in a white coat did it for you and it was in a tray the next day, that sort of thing. Nowadays, I mean, wh wh what sort of information do, do teachers, let alone DOSs, have to process? I mean, teachers, uh, they, they need to um, be able to know pretty much about three or four different course book series with all the concomitant DVDs and, and testing modules. They need to be able to um, upload their, their lessons to, to Moodle perhaps to, to, for, for the stragglers to pick up on later on. They need to be able to fix the photocopier, let alone photocopy things when it breaks down. 
Uh, huge, huge information overload potential. Um, the, the newspaper article uh, that I read was something to do with a completely different field altogether, a field of medicine. Uh, and um, uh, the, uh, it focused on the growing complexity there of, of uh, what, what doctors have to, have to face in, in their, their lives as professionals. Um, so maybe that's the, the next jumping off phase for, for us here, uh, before you get too dizzy with uh, this crash plane. Um, professionalism. Um, what exactly are the ingredients of professionalism generally? Take, just take two minutes with the, the person beside you to see if you can, you can define what, uh, what a profession is. Not professional, but what a profession is. I'll have a look. <laughs> That's great. So you've had to think about it. Well, I mean, I, I, did my, I did my research on this, and one of the things that came up was that there's no such thing as a profession. It's all a figment of our imagination. But, but no, the, the serious people come up with things like this. A profession does require specialist knowledge, education, training, and ethics. Uh, secondly, um, this is the interesting one. We all know this. It invokes altruism. It, it's, it's more than just a job. It's, you know, come five o'clock, none of us, I'm sure, say, so, oh, well, my contract says seven hours, I'm off. You know, if, if the work's there, it has to be done, we'll do it. Uh, and we'll also probably take a bit of time to, uh, you know, as Mike said, you know, talk to our teachers and, and uh, you know, do sessions at conferences, which you don't get necessarily credit for at the time. But you think after, afterwards, well, it was worth it for the profession. Yeah. Um, and finally, this is the important one, and certainly for ELT, I think this is, this is uh, crucial. It's got members who meet to agree common standards uh, for those in or, or wishing to enter the field. That's a big one, I think. Um, now, all this means that uh, there's a lot of detail. Uh, the common standards involve mastery of, of, uh, uh, of knowledge, of uh, facts, and so on. Uh, if that uh, is somehow not there, what do we get? Well, the answer is failure. And I, I was going to say you know, some euphemism here like lack of success or a uh, bad day, but let's face it, failure can, can happen in our organization as much as it can happen with that guy who piloted the plane. So why do we fail? Um, well, uh, there are uh, lots of reasons why we fail, but you can boil them down to about three, I think. Uh, things that you just, you know, beyond our capacity. I mean, if you put me in a pilot seat, I wouldn't even get down the runway. I couldn't find the, 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 the bloody place where you put the key to start it. Um, but possibly this is also due to ignorance. I haven't had a training course, you know, so um, that, that's a key thing. And the very important thing uh, is when you have had the training course, ineptitude. So what you know, you think you know, but you, uh, you apply it wrongly, incorrectly, you, you, you screw it up, in other words. Which one of these is the most dominant? Well, um, I would say until about the 1970s, ignorance was, was pretty much the most dominant. I think since then, uh, there's been you know, a wonderful you know, uh, movement for professional training. Uh, which has changed away from, you know, the old sort of rote, you know, the old rote learning type of training where you 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 you, you um, sort it up for for weeks and weeks on end. You did the knowledge and you uh, did an exam at the end of it, and if you failed the exam, that was it. It's changed obviously much more towards on-the-job training and and uh, learning in teams, developmental training, the whole feedback cycle, and everything else. Um, coaching, long hours, the sort of thing that we all do in CELTA courses, for example. Um, but errors still happen. Um, operations and, and, and medical side of things, operations are bungled. Uh, trains and planes crash out of the sky despite all the amazing training that, that people get. Um, and in language teaching, well, what would be the, what would be the uh, uh, equivalent of that, uh, that plane landing at the end of the runway? Um, I don't know, maybe you have your own thoughts. Um, I, I can think of something from my experience, uh, 
somebody who enrolled for a language course, huge investment from their sponsor, nine months, they were still at pre-intermediate at the end of it. Now, I mean, that, in a way, that to me is a sort of a, a failure of something. So, we need a, an effective strategy to, to avoid failure, to, to get things right. And what is that strategy? Answer the checklist. Now, we'll take a, a little uh, professional uh, step in another direction here, I think. Uh, if any of you thought about uh, being a doctor, perhaps, before you went into uh, ELT? Uh -huh. the, the, the seven years of training, the, uh, the long nights, the, the hospital duty put you off, is that right? Um, I mean, in, in, in medicine, really, they, they, they do have an awful lot to, to know. I mean, they paid more than us, just about, but they, they have a lot, to, a lot to think about. They've got 13,000 diseases, uh, injury types, assorted syndromes. This is on top of knowing all the bones and muscles in the body, of course. Um, what else? They've got to know roughly around about 6,000-plus drugs. Maybe not all of them, but a lot of them. How to apply them, uh, know what they mean. Uh, and um, on the surgical side, for uh, an awful lot of surgical procedures as well. So that, that sort of knowledge is, uh, is intense. Let's get back to uh, the, the, the idea of the checklist. Um, the, um, the, the, the guy who was referred to in the article, I, I, I sort of dipped into him a bit, and I'll give you the reference at the end, a guy called Atul uh, Gawandi. Uh, he uh, traces the origin of the checklist back to 1935. Um, and uh, uh, in 1935, uh, the, the U.S. Army uh, had a, a sort of tender for a, for a new aeroplane. And you've got to think, in 1935, aeroplanes weren't very sophisticated. There were still aeroplanes with, with two wings, one engine, uh, pilots sitting with you know, no canopy over their head. It was, it was quite sort of early days of aviation. Um, I think three or four planes were... were, were put on the, the final list, and uh, the last one to take off, you know, to I did do a loop around the, the, the airport was uh, something called the Boeing 299. And um, it took off, lumbered down the runway, huge big thing with four engines, really slow, uh, s uh, rose slowly into the air, and after about 300 meters, it banked, and then suddenly just fell out of the sky and came to uh, a rest in a field. Luckily, well, I mean, I think, I think there were five people on the plane, three, three died, and I think two, two managed to escape with some injuries. Um, so, obviously, Boeing didn't win the tender. Um, and, uh, but, but, but a lot of the, the, the Army pilots were, were, you know, were fascinated by this big beast and said, well, look, look you know, keep one or two. Don't, don't junk them yet. Keep one or two, and we'll see what we can do. Uh, and, and these test pilots... Um, uh, they got together and, and they, um, they had a chat amongst themselves and, and eventually they, they worked out how, how to fly the thing. The result was uh, not you know, an, a doubling or tripling of the training period, uh, but the checklist. Um, it was uh, probably similar to if you, any of you flew over uh, to, to or probably some of you did fly over to, to the conference, uh, you know, when you go in the plane and you see the, the guys in the cabin, they're, they're going over, chatting to each other over a little list. That sort of thing still exists today, and it gets you from A to B very well and very safely. But back in those days, uh, the, the Boeing 299 had a, an awful lot of uh, new instruments and dials and switches to flick. It was very complicated. As one of the pilots said, it was, it was uh, too much plane for one pilot to fly. Uh, and yeah, that's, that's the sort of little thing they had uh, before and uh, uh, four engines after. So a, a huge leap in capacity for error. And uh, in, uh, in pilot's terms, an error, of course, can be, can be fatal. In the ELT terms, one of the first things uh, I caught my fellow DOSs saying uh, as, um, uh, when, when I was uh, starting the job was that in, in our line of work, nobody dies. And I hope that's true, actually. I've, I've never checked with worldwide DOSs, but, but so far, luckily, I think it is. Um, if we make a mistake, uh, we, we don't usually end up in a, a field at the end of a runway or, or, or worse. Anyway, there, the pilot's uh, checklist criteria, you know, like, like any good criteria, were short and sweet. Keep it simple, brief, relevant. Uh, keep it 
short enough to fit on one of these things and uh, cover the basic points for the particular task in hand. Of course, you have, you have multiple che checklists. There's not just one checklist for a plane. Of course, there's lots of different checklists for doing different things. Uh, but it should cover the basic points for that particular task. For takeoff, for example, it's you know, things like have you on, released the brakes and uh, unlocked the elevator, little important things like that. The result of all this was that uh, Boeing, uh, as you probably realize, didn't go out of business. Uh, they, they built, I think, uh, 12,000 of these uh, airplanes, which I think became called uh, the B-17. Uh, they flew for, I think it was 1.8 million miles uh, and were an amazing uh, addition to the strategic advantage for the USA in the Second World War. Outside today, I mean, outside uh, aeronautics today, Funnily enough, the checklist hasn't had a very good press. In fact, I would say there's quite little respect for it. Um, you, you do see things uh, in the press referring to, you know, busybodies with clipboards and, um, you know, I think the, the phrase a tick box mentality is kind of pejorative at the moment. Am I, am I right? Are there any other phrases that, you, you know, you come to mind? Any other sort of negative connotation phrases? Well, I mean, bit of homework for you. But, but I think the, the idea is that here as, as uh, creative ELT types, you're, you know, our, our, A, our jobs are maybe just too complicated to, to be reduced to a checklist. And hey, you know, it's, it's for, you know, dull, boring people. It's not for us. But I don't know. I, um, I would rather go into a plane <laughs> where the, the guys have a checklist and they're, they're dull and boring uh, than go into a plane with a, you know, uh, the equivalent of a pilot who's just come off a, a CELTA course and has got an A for being very creative and, and wild and confident with every, every type of student. Anyway, the message here is should we care about, uh, about this sort of detail in ELT? Should we formalize a way to, to manage it? And of course, I think the answer is yes. And I think uh, also that it, it is a sign of our professionalism that we were able to, to manage this detail. And I'll, I'll just have a look uh, again back into the medical field to show what can happen uh, if you do actually take a bit of time and trouble to, to, to use checklists. I mean, you all know about doctors before an operation. They, they're supposed to do certain things. Uh, and this has always been the way. I mean, doctors are pretty highly trained and, and, uh, and should do these things, except um, in John Hopkins Hospital in, in 2000, they noticed that people were, were dying and they shouldn't be dying because of infection and basic procedures. Sticking a line in uh, to somebody, uh, sticking a drip in uh, prior to an operation, uh, people were still getting infections and dying from that and they shouldn't. Uh, what was happening? Well, uh, they decided that they would introduce a checklist, like pilots have a checklist, uh, and, and see if that made things better. Um, at the time, medicine there was governed by uh, really high-status surgeons who had a lot of clout, big egos, and, and uh, you know, ordered people around and told them what to do. What they did with the checklist was they empowered the, the low, lowest level person in the operating theater, I think the, 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 the sister, uh, to make sure that before the operation started, all these things were done and to challenge people if they weren't. So, Five little things, wash your hands, clean patient skin, and so on and so on. Um, what happened after this? Well, uh, they, they, being good doctors and, and research-based and everything, they, they checked it after a year. Uh, the, the rates of 10-day line infection had dropped from 11% to, to zero. 43 uh, infections had been prevented, probably eight deaths. and. Uh, two million dollars saved. Pretty good. What did they try to do next? Well, obviously, they, they tried to roll it out over the whole, uh, the whole state because it works. You know, you can save people's lives, save money, and so on. They met, interestingly, a lot of resistance. Uh, people don't like checklists. However, uh, uh, somebody with a bit of clout uh, did, did uh, manage to... Uh, uh, push it through in, in the uh, Michigan uh, Health Service. And after five years, I think the statistics said that roughly 1,500 lives had been saved, 100, roughly $175 million in costs, 
and all because of this stupid little checklist that nobody wanted to implement. So there's a message there somewhere. For me, the message was to look back on my Friday and think, well, hey, maybe I should get myself a checklist. This will be probably very different from any Friday checklist that you have, but you know, that, that's mine, it works. My Mondays are an awful lot better now. I, I have uh, uh, really done away with all the medication on Monday, apart from one, one quick coffee. So checklists, they, they work well for, for pilots. I think the idea is that uh, they, they're good in teams. You sit down, you, you create the checklist, you talk about them, you do them, you enact them. And as I said with the medical example, you, you empower uh, key staff. You, in a way, you sort of delegate people to, to, to make sure the checklist is in place. So it could be my admin assistant, uh, as it was with the, 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 uh, the theatre sister for uh, the operations in uh, John Hopkins. Um, and I think as well, there's, there's a big incentive on anybody who introduces checklists to monitor their effects over time. So if, if there's a, a checklist that, that you introduce for a specific uh, process in, in your school, then you may want to have a look and see what uh, has been uh, affected for the better by it uh, over the years. You know, do your evidence, do your data. Why not publish it in, in one of the journals? Uh, it's, uh, it could be a good way to bring this useful little tool uh, into, into ELT management. So the, the, future, the future task for, for us as DOSs could be to not just work with ourselves, but maybe to work with teachers as well, uh, to, to use checklists in, inside and outside class to en enhance the, the quality. And of course, um, things can go wrong. Um, we all know the example of uh, Captain Sullenberger, uh, who uh, famously landed his uh, 737 on the Hudson River a few years ago uh, after what he flew into a flock of geese, didn't he, at about 1,000 feet, both engines dead. What does he do? He, he doesn't actually uh, step into the, the, uh, the locker in, the, in, the, in the, uh, the cabin and you know, go through the files and pick out a cardboard checklist. No, it's in his head. He's been through it many, many times. He's done the training. He's got three things he must do to get that plane back uh, safely to, to Earth, even if it's on the river. And he does them, and he's uh, 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 given all the credit for it. These three situations could be something that uh, we're faced with as, uh, uh, as uh, DOSs, perhaps, the, the, the typical uh, client complaint. Hans Ruhlbund, Ignaz Lisp, Anna Siriosa, those are the situations. The second and final before lunch uh, little bit of power work is see if you can you know, get three little boxes to, to take, the sort of things a DOS might want to do uh, uh, with that. What is, what is your little checklist that works every time for that? <laughs> Give it a go. <laughs> okay, uh, let's, um, let's see if there's a, an answer or two. I know lunch is drawing near. We'll try to finish on time, but um, anybody volunteer to... Give a couple of points here. It's a useful one, this, I think, the, 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 the student complaint one. Any, anybody want to volunteer? If not, just grab somebody, Sean. Yeah. I think some of those problems could be resolved if you have a, on your checklist that um, staff, teachers are aware of the staff handbook, and in the staff handbook it's made explicit. Uh, there, are, there are notes on uh, lesson delivery and what should be uh, the content yeah. of a lesson um, so that teachers... Yeah know exactly that they should be doing pronunciation, they should be doing yeah. you know, uh, grammar input and so on. The, the preemptive checklist, yeah. in other words, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. My feelings, which may not necessarily be yours, but, but in terms of uh, the, the general things, when uh, somebody comes to you, you've got to obviously listen carefully, you've got to promise some action, uh, you've got to ensure that whatever happens, that that person leaves knowing uh, that they have faith in you, that they're, they're satisfied that, that you will actually do something which results in change, and then follow up, you know, uh, enact the change, whatever it is. So you see, it's quite, it's quite general, but those are key things that I, I think uh, we all should be doing. Any additions or uh, uh, corrections even? Ah, oh, you're all getting hungry, that's great. <laughs> okay, so uh, that's it for me. I mean, I'll say that other, other professions, uh, use checklists a lot. If we're going to be prof really professional, uh, I suspect we need to use them a bit more than we probably do. I'm not saying we don't, but I, I think 
they, they could be there, uh, and they could be created by us as DOSs with our teams more than, than they are. Uh, the alternative, of course, to use to extend the, the flying metaphor is flying by the seat of our pants, which uh, we really don't want to do too much. And we certainly don't want that pilot on British Airways 345 back to uh, Kiev doing, do we, uh, or wherever else you happen to be flying. So let's not muddle through. Let's work out the detail. Let's be professionals. Uh, and uh, let's uh, not get too phased by the complexities in our lives and on Friday afternoons. Use checklists to navigate through all the terrors of excess information. Thanks very much, everybody. And if you want the, the reference, uh, that's it up there. Inspiring little book, uh, especially the, the bits on, on medicine, uh, lots of which obviously I haven't even gone near in this short talk. Thank you very much. Thank you.